so metals and ceramics. Uh, the smaller the grain size, uh, this is uh, the hot patch relation, uh, the higher uh, the, the, the yield strength. So this is uh, nanocrystalline, uh, bulk nanocrystalline nickel and uh, bulk nanocrystalline copper. And you don't need any alloying and just by reducing the grain size, uh, you can get to something like one gigapascal. And uh, you also have, it uh, doesn't have to be grain size, it can be uh, sample size. So uh, leading work done by uh, Mike Uchik and the Bill Nix uh, in these uh, micro pillars and later nano pillars, uh, nano wires, uh, porous materials. Uh, generally, uh, the smaller the characteristic size, the bigger the dynamic range of uh, tension and, and shear that a material can sustain. And the reason is uh, really due to a change in the defect population dynamics. Uh, in a bulk material, uh, you always have uh, dislocation sources uh, like Frank Reed source. So what you need is to propagate and dislocation they breed when they move. So all you need is to for them to overcome uh, those obstacles. And, and so it's a, it's a mobility controlled uh, uh, strength. But uh, in these pillars, uh, actually the Frank Reed source uh, is not so stable, right? Remember, it needs uh, two pinning points. So those pinning points actually are not uh, completely immobile. So they actually, due to the image attraction, is very easily actually swept out of uh, the, 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 the lattice into grain boundaries or, 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 or surfaces. And so you turn uh, more uh, to a defect uh, nucleation controlled uh, strength. So uh, Ting Zhu uh, and I have written uh, a review uh, and we defined this uh, concept called the ultra strength, uh, which is if you have a material component uh, and if it sustains more than uh, one tenth of its ideal shear or tenth of strength, and because uh, this number is about one tenth of the shear or tenth of modulus, if you have a 1% uh, elastic stream, uh, sample wide uh, in your component for extended time, uh, then that's called ultra strength. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, e even in normal materials uh, near uh, defect cores, you very easily can have this kind of uh, stress or strain. Uh, the essential feature is the <clears throat> space time volume. That you say that you need to have uh, this kind of a elastic stream pervasively in a big enough volume over years, and then you can take advantage of it. So um, here are some examples, uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, zinc oxide nanowires, uh, silk nanowires, uh, gold nanowires, nanoparticles, uh, nanospheres, and then uh, two-dimensional graphene. So this column is the theoretical number. You can do a density functional theory calculation that roughly uh, you get one, uh, over, I mean, uh, one tenth of the Young's modulus. So for carbon nanotube is a hundred gigapascal. Uh, so uh, yeah, these are kind of the numbers you get uh, either by this rule of sum or from DFT calculation. Uh, this column uh, was sort of 10 years ago uh, was the experimental numbers. And you see that you get a significant fraction of the ideal strength or sometimes even exceeding the theoretical ideal strength. Uh, so uh, uh, one thing I want to point out was that uh, in, in this uh, graphene case, right, you have uh, extreme size in the Z direction, but you can be extended in X and Y. Uh, uh, we've done uh, a DFT calculation, so uh, uh, we calculate that a, a monolayer graphene uh, would be uh, phonon stable until about 110 gigapascal. And then a year later uh, from Columbia, uh, people measured 130 uh, gigapascal. So that's how the experiment looked like. Uh, when just put a monolayer graphene uh, on a, a hole of uh, one micron to 1.5 micron, and then use a, a nodding denter tip uh, with a radius that's either uh, 27 or 16 nanometer, just poke on this membrane until uh, it breaks. 
And what they found uh, very nicely was that, number one, to fit uh, this experimental low displacement curve, uh, you need a nonlinear uh, stress strain relation. And number two is that uh, right where it, it breaks, uh, if you just compute the tension from uh, continuum mechanics, uh, you know, right beneath the, the tip, it's on, on this order that uh, you know, uh, we've uh, predicted a, a year ago. And so uh, now um, what we've predicted a year ago was that this is the uh, uh, so-called phonon dispersion relation. So this is, uh, the vibrational frequency versus the uh, wavelengths uh, of the phonon. And this is the uh, density state of the phonons. And uh, there is no band gap. So uh, uh, from zero to uh, 1600 uh, uh, inverse centimeter, uh, you have uh, always vibrational modes with this frequency. But uh, this is a stress strain curve. But when you pull it by 20%, and there is this uh, Poisson contraction, uh, and the stress is 110 uh, gigapascal, uh, we see a very wide uh, phononic band gap uh, that opens up. And so uh, since we know that uh, heat conduction, and in fact, uh, electron phonon uh, uh, coupling and uh, superconductivity, all these things depend on phonons. So the fact that, you know, by the time this is, you know, before it breaks, uh, it's a very different, uh, graphene from you know our normal graphene, so that's the that's the take home message. And things like uh, thermal electricity, uh, thermal conductivity, superconductivity uh, are probably all going to change. So, if we look at this uh, traditional uh, deformation mechanism map, uh, where the x-axis is a uh, homologous temperature, so it's the exposure temperature normalized by the bulk melting temperature. And the vertical axis is the uh, deleteric uh, shear stress normalized by the, young, uh, by the shear modulus. Then uh, Frankel's uh, prediction is here. Uh, this is basically if you have a perfect crystal, no defects, and not even surfaces, uh, just purely boundary condition. Uh, and then also no thermal fluctuation. Then you strain the crystal to 10%, then the bond is going to automatically uh, break. And then uh, you're going to either have a phase transformation or dislocation nucleation or twin nucleation. So that's, that's the ideal strength uh, limit. So we have this uh, low temperature, high stress uh, displacive plasticity. So you have a strain rate independent. So here we see strain rate from 10 to minus 10 to 10 to two per second. Uh, a low temperature is not strain rate sensitive. You, you basically have to go to the yield stress to have any strain rate. Uh, but then at high temperature, you have the Cobalt creep, you have the Navarro herring creep. And then in the middle, you have these uh, hybrid uh, diffusive uh, displacive processes, uh, power law creep. Uh, so where the uh, most of the strain is given by dislocation glide, but uh, the rate is controlled by dislocation overcoming some obstacles, recovery by uh, diffusive process. Uh, anyway, but what you see is, you know, in, in, in conventional material, uh, you are way uh, below the, uh, the ideal strength. However, the key here is the grain size is a coarse grain material. This is pure nickel with 100 micron uh, grain size. So what had happened in the last uh, 20, 30 years is, We've got these bulk nanocrystals, uh, thin films, nanoporous materials, uh, metallic glass, nanowires, nano this and that. And uh, we measure very high uh, strength, you know, a significant fraction and even uh, approaching the ideal strength. And the reason is really because of this uh, size scale. So uh, King and I wrote uh, a review where we uh, delineate how these domains of deformation mechanisms uh, would shift uh, with size scale. So some of these would get stronger and stronger. Some of these would actually get much, much weaker uh, when you uh, reduce the size scale. So, so the boundaries of these countries uh, shift uh, with size scale. Uh, and that has to do with the, the defect population dynamics that uh, we mentioned. <clears throat> and uh, now using uh, this elastic strain, in fact, 
uh, is already in everybody's uh, computer. So in the mid 2000s, uh, IBM and Intel, uh, they put uh, silicon uh, on top of this uh, silicon germanium alloy. Uh, so this was uh, actually some work uh, at MIT uh, uh, in, the, in the mid 90s where one is able to grow the substrate without any dislocations. <laughs> and uh, by having a biaxial uh, tensile strain on this uh, silicon channel, uh, this is 50 nanometers, uh, you can uh, make the carrier mobility uh, faster uh, by uh, about 100%. So uh, this is actually one important technology that delays the breakdown of the Moore's law. <clears throat> so uh, what is new uh, now? So, what is new is uh, we are way beyond 1%. Uh, this is uh, a work in collaboration with uh, Professor Yang Lu uh, at the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, and he was uh, previously a postdoc with Subra. Uh, so uh, this is a 110 uh, silicon uh, nanowire. So it's a single crystal. Uh, actually, in terms of length, it's a, it's a microwire. And he showed that in this lens, uh, you can strain this uh, reversibly elastically beyond the 13%, 13, 14%. And eventually it fractures and it just oscillates there. But before it fractures, it's very uh, big uh, tensile strain. And uh, very recently, uh, again, uh, in collaboration with Yang, uh, we've shown that this can be extended to diamond. Uh, diamond is a uh, sort of Mount Everest of uh, electronic material because it has very high uh, carry mobility, very high thermal conductivity, very high dielectric uh, breakdown strength. So uh, here we're not just straining one, we're straining three uh, micro bridges uh, simultaneously by putting it uh, up to uh, six, uh, seven percent in tension. Uh, and and uh, this uh, means that you know each of this is actually uh, we can integrate. Uh, thousands of uh, transistors. On. So this then becomes a, uh, a, a maybe a wafer scale platform uh, to do uh, strained uh, electronics. So the natural question is, you know, if you are way beyond 1%, if you are, you know, 6, 10, uh, 14%, uh, what does it give you uh, for these uh, electronic materials? And this is not new uh, to physicists, right? So uh, all the DFT people know that if you change the uh, lattice spacing or change the, the, the bond angle, you are going to change physical properties. So at the dawn of uh, semiconductor uh, physics, uh, Bardeen and Shockley, so these are the uh, founding fathers of, of semiconductors, um, they've talked about uh, piezo uh, resistivity. So it's basically as you, strain uh, uh, silicon or germanium, uh, how does the uh, electrical resistivity change? <laughs> so what, what they've done was they, they used uh, this thing called the K dot P and deformation potential series. So these are perturbation linear response uh, series. And that has been the mainstay of, of industry for, for 50 years. And what is new is uh, recently uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Alex Shapif, uh, Ming Dao and uh, Super Suresh, uh, uh, my student uh, Frank Shi and uh, Evgeny uh, have used uh, machine learning combining with uh, DFT calculation to uh, we think for the first time get an on the fly view of this constitutive relation between elastic strain and uh, phononic and the electronic uh, band structure. So, you know, you cannot attack this problem uh, by brute force because uh, band structure depend on K, the wave vector, so that's uh, three dimensional. And then strain is a six dimensional. So right away you have nine dimensional. So if each dimension you have, you know, 20 uh, mesh points, and if you just attack this problem by a tabulation approach, you know, you cannot even store uh, this kind of data. So what we've done is just to do tens of thousands of calculations with DFT and uh, sometimes uh, with thousands of uh, GW calculation, which is more expensive uh, and combining with a uh, new network re representation, 
uh, we can get basically a very good set of uh, the DFT calculations. So uh, we've checked a few different uh, machine learning frameworks, but uh, turns out that new network is uh, pretty good, is the best. And so, uh, you know, when we look at the strain tensor, uh, it's, uh, it's a six dimensional, right? You have the three uh, normal and the three uh, off diagonal strains. So a uh, six dimensional space uh, is a bit difficult to realize. So uh, we've used therefore uh, this uh, uh, elastic string energy density. Uh, water. <clears throat> To, uh, to realize it. So, uh, so this is uh, in uh, milli electron volt uh, per angstrom cube. So how much uh, elastic string energy you inject uh, into your uh, unit cell. Uh, and uh, what we are plotting is so-called the density of band gap. Uh, in other words, if I say I take 10 uh, milli electron volt per angstrom cubed, uh, there are many, many uh, uh, elastic string combinations uh, which can give me uh, this uh, uh, string energy density. But out of those, this color, this blue color, shows you the distribution of band gap uh, in silicon, still for diamond cubic silicon, still within the diamond cubic uh, energy basin. So you see that it ranges from zero all the way to something like 1.2 electron volt. So there are strains which give you metallic diamond cubic silicon and there are strains which give it something like an infrared detector band gap and some which give you, you know, a little bit higher band gap. Now, where was the experiment uh, that we showed? That was the experiment. So we have already in 2016 achieved this much elastic string energy density, all right? And <clears throat> what from the calculations we discovered that if we can just you know, do a little bit more without fracturing, uh, we would hit this little island. And this little island uh, is direct band gap silicon. And we have direct band gap silicon, the blue is indirect band gap. Uh, you would have much stronger interaction with photons, you have much uh, thinner photovoltaic cells, and, and also you can make miniaturized lasers, all right? So, uh, so uh, you know, coming back uh, to unstrained silicon, so unstrained silicon is 1.1 electron volt. Uh, if we sort of pay attention to this, this line here, so this is the cheapest way to reduce uh, the band gap of silicon. Uh, you know, with the least amount of elastic string energy, because this is a lower bound of this density of band gap uh, plot. Uh, it turns out that you can't increase the band gap a lot, but it's very easy to find the strains to reduce the band gap of silicon. And, and you really don't need to do a lot uh, to make silicon an infrared detector or even make it metallic compared to where we already achieved. And let's compare uh, this strain path uh, with, uh, you know, perturbation series. So what I'm showing you here are the uh, six uh, strain components uh, in the void uh, notation. Uh, and, and this is the very first metallic silicon. So this is the first metallic silicon with the least amount of string energy. Uh, and, and what you see is that uh, nature uh, throw, throws a curveball. Uh, in other words, uh, if you use K.P. theory, then you have these tangents. They will be the direction of a steepest descent uh, to reduce the band gap of silicon around here. But to make it truly metallic, uh, you actually, the, the, the ball curves. Uh, and this turned out to be the first metal. And this is the reason uh, we need to do machine learning. Uh, you just can't do perturbation theory, you know, when you try to uh, navigate uh, these uh, deep uh, strange spaces. Uh, another benefit of uh, machine learning uh, is it allows us to quickly visualize uh, topological transitions. So what you see here is looks like a Tresca yield surface. It is in uh, 
uh, the three normal strain components space, we can visualize a uh, six dimension. So this is a reduced version. Uh, this is a, a band gap uh, ISO surface. So if you want to look at all the 0.9 EV uh, band gap silicon, then these are the strains uh, that give you that. Uh, and you see that it has these uh, discontinuous ridges. Uh, the reason is uh, that band gap is a composite quantity of the conduction band uh, minimum minus the valence band maximum. And the VBM and the CBM themselves can have symmetry transitions. So when you shear uh, the crystal, you know, you can go from gamma point uh, to, the, to the Y point, right? So, so these are uh, topological transitions uh, in, in, in those band edges. And then uh, you also have three ridge lines coming to a cusp. So we have used uh, the machine learning model to classify uh, this kind of uh, topological uh, features uh, in the strain space. And uh, in the early version, we learned this uh, band by band. Uh, but later, uh, we uh, used convolution neural network and we learned all of them together. Uh, and we've also uh, have done some transfer learning uh, going from DFT to uh, GW calculation. So uh, this is some uh, recent uh, updated version. And what you're seeing here is the uh, uh, density of band gap for diamond, right? So, uh, our common diamond is 5.5 uh, uh, electron volt. It turns out that uh, our experiment uh, that Yang Lu showed is somewhere here. Uh, actually, uh, a few years ago, uh, super group uh, have shown you can make it metallic, uh, near metallic in here. So uh, you can easily make diamond uh, direct band gap. And then you can also fall into the visible uh, range. The visible range is here. And you also have uh, this kind of uh, indirect uh, to direct band gap uh, transitions. So this gamma is, is direct band gap uh, uh, surface. So uh, we've been developing a uh, new network interatomic potentials. And one thing that we found was that new network generally is pretty good in giving you uh, the energy, uh, a scalar parameter. But when you compute the forces, uh, sometimes there are some um, numerical noise. And so a question is how good can the new network representation of the strain dependent uh, band structure give you this effective mass? Because effective mass uh, is directly related to mobility. And this is something we want to optimize. So 0.3 means that it's uh, much lighter uh, than a free electron. So, uh, but it's a second derivative of uh, the band structure. And, and so there is some numerical you know, issues on, on how good we can predict uh, the second derivative. And it turns out that this is manageable. So we can get a pretty good uh, training and uh, validation and prediction accuracy compared with uh, our, our training data, as well as, as our actual experiment. So we can get a predictive model of, of the carrier mobilities. And uh, a few years ago, uh, 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 Subra and, and Yang Lu have shown that you can have this uh, diamond needle and you can bend it. And uh, we have shown uh, recently that uh, while avoiding phase transitions, uh, it might be possible to make diamond a metal on, on the bending side, on, on the on tensile side of, of this bent wire. So this is a final element calculation using the machine learning uh, string energy density as the constitutive relation. And I just want to say that uh, this kind of freestanding uh, diamond, uh, a wire, uh, may be the future for uh, three-dimensional electronics. So uh, this is uh, uh, my uh, collaborator, uh, Jesus uh, De Alamo at MIT, and uh, they're making this thing called a FinFET. So this is indium guarding arsenide, a thing fat. And you, you make these very uh, uh, long uh, things. Uh, I mean, this is freestanding things. And then uh, you gate, uh, and then uh, you, you make a field effect transistor. And 
uh, the, uh, the width of this is just uh, uh, 20 nanometers and now it's sub 10 nanometers. So this is kind of very similar to this kind of freestanding uh, structures. So now we are collaborating with uh, Hisu's group uh, to actually actuate this kind of structure and see how the field effect transistor behavior will change upon applying you know, uh, a deep uh, strain. And from the calculations, the behavior is, is very rich. So this is just a, a, a cross section uh, you know, of, of, of some uh, strain uh, uh, surface where uh, outside of the dash line, uh, uh, the diamond would have a phonon instability. So it will lose a lattice stability. But inside you have this yellow region where it's an indirect metal like this. Uh, you can have an indirect band gap uh, semiconductor, which is the white region. You have this blue region, which is a direct band gap semiconductor, and this long orange sliver, which is a direct uh, metal. So we have four uh, possible kind of, it's almost like a phase diagram uh, in the strain space uh, for diamond. And uh, for the first time, uh, uh, we have shown the true ideal strain surface by uh, parameterizing the uh, phonon instabilities. And again, you have these topological transition features. And this is one way to realize a six dimensional strain. So these are the three, uh, epsilon one, one, epsilon two, two, epsilon three, three, epsilon two, three, epsilon one, three. These are three uh, shear strains. And the CN is phonon stable. The magenta is uh, phonon unstable. So we have finally, you know, this, uh, five-dimensional surface embedded in six-dimensional strain space, uh, a numerical representation uh, for a phonon stability and ideal strain surface that uh, Yakov uh, Frankel predicted uh, in 1926 uh, analytically. But of course, in, uh, with real materials, this is going to be more complicated. So uh, I want to uh, um, show you a few applications. And the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, I think uh, string engineering can be the ultimate mechanical metallurgy because uh, from my Ohio State uh, colleagues, I'm, I'm now uh, you know, uh, trained as, as a physical metallurgist. Uh, so what I mean is that, uh, okay, but, but even going back, uh, so you know, we have this kind of magical uh, chemical alloys, right? So we have the, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Silicon Age. Uh, and if you think about it, it's not because our ancestors actually knows uh, quantum mechanics or, 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 or physical metallurgy. I mean, all they know was that uh, the liquid melt composition is a continuously tunable parameter. So let's say, you know, if you add, you know, too much dirt, you know, in this pot, you know, give you, uh, you know, bad property, you know, for this metal, then let's just try to reduce the amount of dirt, this kind of dirt uh, that we put into it, right? So there is generally no symmetry principle that for anything that you care, uh, that the first order derivative is zero. So the same thing uh, can be said for elastic strain. And uh, in uh, 1959, uh, uh, Feynman gave a talk at the APS banquet uh, called the Plenty of Room at the Bottom. So he was uh, you know, envisioning what the miniaturization can bring forth. And he was saying, you know, beyond the just uh, geometric scaling, there are also uh, uh, non-classical scaling effects, so non-simple scaling effects. And he was actually focusing a lot on mechanics. He was talking about a hundred little hands, and he was talking about gears, you know, which make us make, make us stuck. So we're talking a lot about mechanical issues when things uh, get small. So uh, this is a special issue we did in 2014. Uh, it is really giving another play to this uh, thing called the room uh, at the bottom. So we're saying that because uh, smaller is stronger, so as you nano structure the material, you have the whole patch scaling. So uh, when you get to small nano uh, sizes, you have a much bigger uh, strain space room uh, to play with properties. So uh, these properties could be electronic properties, magnetic properties, optical, 
plasmonic, ionic, phononic, thermoelectric, uh, chemical, like catalytic, anything you care about. Uh, generally, there is no symmetry principle that say that your uh, uh, you know, stress-free lattice constant uh, give you the optimal property. And so if you know, going in a certain direction is bad, just reverse the direction and going to improve your figure of merit. Now, before 1986, though, you know, we have a lot of pre uh, you know, high pressure physics. We have uh, somewhat you know, uh, physical metallurgies and fracture mechanics. Uh, but we don't have a lot of materials which can sustain uh, you know, this kind of deviatoric uh, shear and tensile stresses. But now we know the game is completely changed. In the last uh, 30 years, there's just too many uh, like uh, nano stuff, you know, which can sustain 50, 70, or even 90% of the ideal strain. So, so now we have this big explosion of stuff and we also have the tools uh, to strain them. And we also have the tools to measure uh, nanoscale properties, uh, sometimes in situ. Uh, and so, uh, I'm going to start with a, a two-dimensional material, which is a, a molydisulfide monolayer. Uh, and this was already shown to be able to sustain up to 11% uh, tensile strain, uh, pretty much indefinitely, at least for a few months. Uh, and uh, uh, in 2012, uh, we uh, saw that if you uh, take a, a, a triangular uh, a 2D material, you, you clamp the boundary and you pull in the middle and you're gonna have a, a tensile uh, a stretching force. Now this stretching force uh, uh, is, is balanced uh, across the, the radius, uh, but because it's constricting, so the stress would go as one over R if, if this is the origin. And then the elastic strain would be one over R and then the band gap would be one over R. Uh, so the band alignment would change as one over R and so for uh, the electrons and holes, uh, this would be like a quantum dot. Uh, and in fact, it's one of ours, so it's like a hydrogen atom, but it's two dimensional and it's actually uh, a few microns in size is much bigger than standard uh, quantum dot. So we're basically saying, okay, what is going to happen when this artificial atoms sees the light? Uh, and you can have three situations. You can have the conduction band minimum uh, going down as one over R and the valence band maximum going up as one over R. So your band gap is changing. And so you can absorb a, a higher frequency light here uh, on outer ridge. And then this electron and this whole uh, electron want to go down in energy, uh, like a, a raindrop on the roof. The hole want to go up like a bubble in the lake. And so this both electron hole you can collect in the origin of this artificial atom. Uh, but you can have a type two where the electron goes to the center, the whole bubbles to the rim. And so you can collect uh, on two sides, but you can also have a situation where even though the hole wants to bubble to the, to the side, but there is strong uh, attraction, uh, Coulombic attraction between them. So the electron drags the hole is, as a charge neutral exton and bring it to the origin and uh, you harvest them there. So uh, we did a bunch of calculations. And, and so what, what this uh, is, is doing is, 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 is quite different from uh, traditional uh, photovoltaics. So in, in traditional photovoltaics, uh, if you uh, generate, uh, let's say an electron hole pair, you rely on random walk of this uh, before it hits an interface where there is a built-in field which can separate uh, the electron hole. Uh, but uh, with a strain gradient, uh, which give you a band gap gradient, uh, this actually drive a drifting motion uh, instead of random walk. And so you can actually have a much bigger funnel for uh, these charge neutral exons. Uh, and uh, we plug in some numbers and we predicted uh, more than a micron distance uh, that with a strain gradient, you can drive uh, these essentially energy carriers uh, electronic energy carriers uh, in uh, in the material to the to the origin, and so here are the details of the calculation. Uh, we've done uh, DFT, then followed by GW, 
And then uh, later we bring the electron hole together to form the exciton, uh, the beta sub Peter equation. This is the calculated fo uh, photon absorption spectrum. So uh, without strain, it's about two electron volt. Uh, with strain, uh, this uh, becomes uh, uh, almost 1.1 uh, electron volt uh, like in uh, silicon. And uh, these are the band edges, which uh, we think is either type two or type three. And eventually uh, we say it's a type three. Now this one over R singularity uh, is not really going to be, you know, uh, divergent because you have a finite radius indenter. So this is regularized at the center, uh, but you can model this uh, as well by doing, uh, you know, DFT calculations. And you can, you, can, you can separate the electron hole at the origin of this artificial atom. And this is the uh, wave function of the, uh, this electron hole pair. And uh, it's actually a, a six dimensional wave function. Uh, so you can't virilize it. Uh, but what you see here is that if we uh, fix uh, the electron and we plot the whole distribution, we see that uh, this um, electronic excited state where you have a hole together with the electron uh, is pretty big object. It's about uh, four nanometers in size. And so it's not a so-called tight exciton and therefore it should have a pretty high mobility. Uh, this is if you fix uh, the hole and, and plot the electron wave function. Uh, but the binding energy is big because uh, in 2D material, you cannot screen the electrostatic interaction uh, very well. So uh, because it has a high binding energy, uh, we don't think the string gradient uh, can, it can polarize the exciton, but it cannot uh, separate it. So therefore the electron hole will drag it together. So uh, a year later, uh, there was an uh, experiment uh, done on a monolayer molydisulfide, which was draped on a PMMA. Uh, and, and when you bend the PMMA, you create tension. And this is still uniform tension. And it's not a lot of tension. It's 0.5%. Uh, uh, but already, you see a visible change uh, in, in the photon absorbance. Uh, you see this, this shift, red shift. And also in the photoluminescence intensity, there's a redshift. And they've measured about uh, 70 milli electron volt per 1% of strain. Uh, we computed something like 100 MeV per 1% of strain. But what is really uh, more, uh, I think, uh, uh, a better prediction is, is inhomogeneous strain. So here, uh, instead of stretching it, uh, uh, these uh, folks were bending uh, the molydisulfide. Uh, they cited our paper and they used our theory and they, they, they verified this funneling uh, effect uh, where uh, you can absorb light at the valley of, uh, of this material, but because there is a band gap gradient with the bending curvature, uh, this exciton can drift hundreds of nanometers and then uh, just stay here and eventually recombine uh, and re-emit as light, but as, as a red shifted light. And so uh, that's a verification of this uh, uh, string engineering uh, concept. So, uh, so that was, you know, sending in photons and, and trying to get some carriers. Uh, there is also a reverse paradigm where you send in carriers, you send some electrons in and you put a photon detector. So that's so-called a custodial luminescence. Uh, so this was done uh, in collaboration with Professor Da Peng Yu and Professor Ji Feng, who was my postdoc at Penn. Uh, and so what you do is you have a photon detector in the uh, scanning electron microscope, and you have a uh, SEM uh, beam, which uh, you are scanning across a uh, zinc oxide wire. And this is actually not even a nano wire. This is a, uh, a micro wire. And it, on the bottom, there is friction. So uh, here, uh, there is no bending moment. And so when you scan, you know, from here to here, and you look at, you know, you collect the, the light that emits. Uh, it doesn't matter where you scan, uh, the light is monochromatic as you scan here, when there is no bending curvature. But then when you scan here, what they found was that 
when you scan on the outer side uh, where there's tension, uh, the light is, uh, uh, is monochromatic red light. But then as you move towards the inside, there is a blue shift. And there is also you know, a smearing of the photon spectrum uh, that, that comes out. And depending on where you scan, where you have different curvature, you get different evolution of the uh, photon distribution. So that is, uh, uh, you know, a string engineering in, in photonics. And uh, we fitted this, you know, with a spline function. Uh, we did some DFT calculations and we've written down this uh, partial differential equation where this N is the concentration, not of electron, but of this charged neutral uh, exciton. D is the diffusivity. So this is the random walk uh, diffusion of this neutral exciton. Uh, these two terms are the drift term uh, that I mentioned, uh, which is proportional uh, to the band gap gradient. Uh, but the band gap gradient is proportional to the elastic string gradient. So you can also think of this as a string gradient. And then D divided by KBT is the mobility of the exiton. So that's the drift term. Uh, this G is the delta function. That's basically you know, where we point our SEM beam at uh, that excite uh, these uh, electron hole pair uh, in the zinc oxide material. And then this is the photon that we emit. So this is a single relaxation time approximation. So if you have at any location this exciton, there is a certain probability you can recombine and you can collect this light uh, by the photo sensor in the, in the SEM. So we put in some reasonable numbers and uh, we can uh, get this kind of a steady state distribution of uh, electronic excitation in the system out of equilibrium excitation. And it's very much uh, like a funnel. It's like a, a, a water, like a kitchen sink. So imagine, you know, this is a tensile side and you aim, you know, the, the water faucet at the center of the, uh, at the center of the kitchen sink where the, you know, the, the height is the lowest. You know, there, you know, the X tongue is not going anywhere. It's already lowest band gap. And so just going to, pull up a little bit there and re-emit as, uh, as, as photons. But as you move away your electron beam to the uh, compressive side, uh, then uh, you know, you're gonna excite electron hole pairs there and some of them you know, get re-emit as, as blue light right away, but then they feel this string gradient across a distance of four microns and they will just move there and pull up at where there is tension and they still re-emit, some of them re-emit as, as the old red light. So you can explain, uh, you can you know, basically uh, explain the experimental uh, photoluminescence spectra. Uh, and you can also apply a, a longitudinal string gradient uh, and, and explain this as well. So the previous two were, you know, uh, uh, IT examples where you don't need a lot of material because you're just straining the material to control the flow of uh, electrons and photons. And it turns out that uh, the, the total amount of silicon you know, in your CPU, I did some quick estimate, is on the order of 10 to the minus 10 kilograms. So really, you know, minuscule uh, amount of material. But my main sort of field is in energy and uh, for anything involving energy generation, transmission, or storage, uh, let's say even if you do catalyst, you still need the kilograms of, of catalyst. Uh, and for, let's say, if you want to do superconducting cables for energy transmission, you need the kilometers and tons of, of, of stuff. So next, I'm going to give you an example where you can scale this uh, to uh, to kilograms, and some of you may have uh, seen this, but there's also some newer updates uh, recently. So uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Professor Li Shansui uh, at uh, China Petroleum University, where uh, uh, he was making this uh, uh, metal composite. Uh, so you have a uh, eutectically uh, solidified uh, material 
where the matrix uh, is nitinol, uh, nickel titanium uh, material. But then there are these micron sized uh, niobium rods uh, distributed uh, in, the, in the cast ingot. But then by very carefully uh, uh, optimizing the wire drawing, you can draw that ingot into these uh, millimeter sized wires where uh, the niobium change from a micron diameter to something like 50 nanometers. So in the cross section of a wire, you have something like 10 million of these niobium nanowires. Now we've known from the in-situ TM study that you know, if I take an individual niobium BCC nanowire, I can definitely strain it you know, to 7%, even 10% in the TM, and I can get true elasticity with an individual wire. But there is this thing called the value of death, right? So when you go from nano to macro, uh, the issue is, can you strain 10 million nano wires together uh, to you know, more than 5% uh, in the deep? Uh, you know, ultra is more than 1%, more than 5%, I call it the deep uh, elastic strain regime. And it turns out that we can, and the trick is that this Nitinol has to be in this B2 to B19 prime uh, pseudo elasticity regime. It has to be in this phase transformation pseudo elastic regime. And you have to match the pseudo elasticity with true elasticity to give macro uh, pseudo elasticity. If you just change the chemistry of the nitinol a little bit, so you know, remember, if you just tweak the liquid melt composition a little bit, and you just have a very uh, you know, small amount of dislocation activity in the matrix, then boom, uh, this nanowire, instead of 6% true elasticity, it goes to 2%, uh, which is you know, nothing extraordinary uh, anymore. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the macroscopic experiment. Uh, so you have this millimeter sized you know, wire, and uh, yeah, so so this is not surprising, right? You get, you take any metal wire, you you strain it to six percent, but generally, you know, uh, when you unload, you would unload plastically, right? You would expect it to lock in something like uh, you know six percent uh, plastic strain. So what is Different is this material, when you unload, uh, it goes all the way back to zero. Okay, so that's the first cycle. And there is some energy dissipation uh, in the nitinol, but it's overall, it's, it's pretty linear looking. And this is the 20 cycle. So the effective modulus is very low, it's like 30 gigapascal. Initially, when Li Shan was doing this research, he was thinking of orthopedic applications because you can have the uh, uh, reduced the uh, strain mat, uh, the uh, uh, load shedding and uh, osteoporosis in, in the bones. It turns out to be more useful in, in the wire form. And he actually have strained uh, to beyond uh, tens of thousands of cycles. Uh, it's, it's very reversible. So I just want to skip here and just, you know, this is just saying this is kind of between polymer and traditional hard materials. And uh, I just want to show this. So this, this is synchrotron diffraction. Uh, so when we change the macro wire strain, this is the uh, BCC Naobium 220 peak. So it really, in the reciprocal space, it really shifted inward. I've never seen anything like this before. It's reversible, tens of thousands cycles. And this is basically saying that the BCC niobium lattice constant is indeed have a true strain of, of 6%. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so, so, which is shown here. And, and, and this is completely reversible. Uh, in these nano wires. And then the matrix, uh, they shifted a little bit, but mostly is, 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 is changing the peak heights because there is this B2 to B19 prime 
uh, phase trans transformation. And the reason uh, you need uh, this uh, string matching is because at the atomistic level, uh, this B2 to B19 prime martensitic phase transformation is a gentle transformation. Between two atomic planes, uh, your true strain, uh, well, your, 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 your phase transformation strain uh, in elastic strain is on the order of six to 7%. It's, it's usually less than 10%. Uh, if you have a dislocation though, uh, that dislocation, if you just look at you know, B over D, it's more than 100%. So dislocation is the bounding rim of a shear fault of an atomic uh, width shear fault. And in that shear fault, uh, the elastic, the, the inelastic strain is very, very intense. It's like a knife, it's a very sharp knife uh, that cuts uh, this interface. And that's going to trigger dislocation nucleation in the Naubium nanowire. So the reason you need to have this uh, strain matching methodology is really because uh, this phase transformation strain is much more gentle uh, at the atomic level. And you know, even compared to you know, deformation twinning in FCC materials, right? At the atomic level, that gives you like 70% in elastic strain. So these phase transformations are gentle, so you do not stimulate dislocation nucleation in the Naubian nanowire, and that's the, that's the trick. And so um, uh, the collaborators have uh, uh, recently shown that uh, this can be used to uh, change the superconductivity properties of malbian based uh, materials. So, you know, it doesn't, just by uh, optimizing the process of the wire drawing, you can lock in uh, different residual strain uh, in the Naubian nanowire. So all these are, are freestanding macro wires, but different process of drawing the wires. And you can uh, retain uh, this kind of strain uh, in the in the Naubium wire. And Naubium is uh, actually pretty widely used uh, in, 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 in uh, maglev trains and MRIs and so forth. And you can shift uh, the uh, TC from 4.5 Kelvin to something like 5.2 Kelvin. That doesn't sound like very much, uh, uh, but uh, remember, this is being cooled by uh, liquid helium. So uh, this actually improved the engineering margin. And also uh, by elastic strain, uh, one can change the upper critical field and lower critical field. So these are the uh, highest magnetic field at which the uh, flux lines uh, penetrate into the material. So this is also an important uh, figure of merit for uh, these uh, superconductors. <clears throat> so this therefore show that you can indeed engineer uh, kilogram scale uh, materials uh, with a uh, string engineering. And, and recently uh, uh, there is also work, uh, this is kind of like a semi review where we can strain a metallic glass. So bulk metallic glass usually just have 2% uh, elastic strain limit. But by this uh, string matching methodology, where you match uh, this uh, a bulk amorphous titanium uh, nickel iron with a nanocrystalline matrix, uh, you can actually achieve uh, 5.9 uh, reversible elastic strain in the glass uh, matrix <laughs> and have a very high uh, elastic resilience of about 80 millijoule, sorry, megajoule per, uh, per cubic meter. And, Glass is uh, actually used uh, as uh, transformer magnets. So uh, I think uh, it's also interesting to look at, you know, how the magnetic properties change uh, in these uh, bulk scale uh, metallic glasses. So I think I'm toward the end of, of my talk. Uh, I just want to sort of finish by saying that, you know, I've been mostly focusing on uh, elastic strain, but of course there is also uh, inelastic strain. Uh, where you, you can definitely take advantage of. And one example is, you know, in this 2D material, for example, most people, you know, talk about this uh, 2H phase. So this is uh, like a HCP uh, material where you have uh, mirror symmetry, but not inversion symmetry. But there is also something called a T phase, uh, which is like the phase center cubic 
structure in 3D, but now it's in 2D, where you have inversion symmetry, but not mirror symmetry. Uh, what we have done, uh, this is with my uh, student Wen Bin Li, uh, is to show that uh, this T phase uh, actually is, is not stable and it uh, uh, reconstructs into this 1T prime uh, reconstructed phases. And so you can have this kind of uh, pseudo, uh, sorry, ferroelastic uh, behavior you, where you have three orientation variants and they form this kind of twin boundaries and this twin boundary actually is a very low energy and uh, pretty, pretty glissal. So you can have a glissal uh, uh, ferroelastic behavior in the material. <clears throat> so yeah, this shows you uh, the, uh, the T structure. Uh, this is the, uh, this is the, the T structure, FCC-like structure. And uh, what happens is, is this is unstable. There is this pulse distortion where it's a one by two reconstruction. Uh, you have uh, the two uh, chalcogen atoms just bunching up together uh, like this or like this or like this. So there are three uh, orientation variants and they all carry some kind of an inelastic shear strain. <laughs> it turns out that this T prime structure uh, is, is interesting. So when these chalcogens do this reconstruction, uh, yeah, so you, you go from the, the, the metallic T structure to the T prime structure for uh, moly disulfide, moly diselenide, moly ditelluride, tungsten disulfide, tungsten diselenide, tungsten ditelluride. <coughs> so six different uh, chemistries. And T, T prime is metastable. But uh, from the calculations, uh, we found that uh, only the tungsten ditelluride uh, and uh, the moly that telluride are sort of have comparable global stability versus H phase. Uh, and when we look at their band structure, this uh, pulse reconstruction uh, sort of tie a knot uh, in the band structure. Because traditionally in, in normal uh, material, uh, your metal uh, uh, D band is the donor, is high in energy, and the chalcogen P band is the acceptor. Uh, because it has higher uh, electronegativity. But because of this uh, structural reconstruction, uh, in some uh, wave vector range, uh, the chalcogen P become the charge donor, and then the metal D uh, uh, becomes the electron acceptor. So that's like opposite, right? It's like in silica, you know, silicon grabs the electron from oxygen. Uh, you know, oxygen gets you know, oxidized and silicon gets reduced. So within this K range, there is this abnormal, abnormality and that's a topological feature. So uh, in our calculation, we found that in all these uh, six compositions, uh, there is this uh, topological inversion at the gamma point. But unfortunately, uh, for the molecular sulfide, this is not uh, thermodynamically stable and then for the thermodynamically stable uh, tungsten ditelluride is an accidental metal. <clears throat> so we really need this gamma point energy to come down to have a true topological insulator. So we used a uh, string engineering trick. We found that by applying a biaxial strain of more than 2%, then you can still keep uh, this fundamental uh, PD uh, band inversion <clears throat> at gamma point, but you open up uh, this accidental metallic behavior. So you would have a true uh, topological insulator, uh, 1T prime tungsten ditelluride, which is also some dynamically stable and uh, synthesizable. And so we published this and then a few years later, uh, people indeed uh, made this uh, 1T prime tungsten ditelluride and uh, uh, people did RPs and they found uh, this topological banding version. Uh, they measured uh, this uh, uh, edge conductance of uh, uh, E square over H uh, up to 100 Kelvin. Uh, there is a magnetic dependence on this. And also uh, this is only true from the calculations uh, for monolayer. When you make a bilayer, it doesn't work. And they also verify that. So uh, this actually relies on the fact that generally when you make a 2D material <laughs> because of the adhesion, uh, you would have a few percent strain <laughs> as well. So um, 
continuing on the sort of uh, photonics trend uh, already in 2013, this is uh, from uh, ETH uh, work from uh, Switzerland. People have done this kind of suspended germanium, just make this constriction and then pull it. And they've pulled it up to 3.1% uh, uh, in this narrowed bridge. And they've seen uh, germanium band gap from 0.8 uh, in the photoluminescence change to something like uh, 0.6. And also the height is greatly elevated. Okay, so this is already seen uh, for, for this kind of uh, uh, near infrared behavior. So uh, we have also done calculations to engineer further uh, in, uh, infrared response by maximizing both uh, this uh, 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 electronic uh, overlap uh, uh, integrals, as well as the, uh, this uh, sort of entropy factor in the uh, joint density states. So uh, generally, uh, by having a topological material, uh, you have this uh, PD uh, band mixture. This is going to greatly improve uh, this blue term here uh, to enhance the dielectric response of the material. But then even for when you, when you change the uh, chemistry and the strain, you can have uh, this kind of so-called Mexican hat uh, band structure. So uh, this is a normal, uh, semiconductor, when we plot the, uh, the overlap matrix, you just have a little bit here uh, at the band gap. When you have this PD banding version, you have a much bigger uh, uh, quantum uh, overlap integral. Uh, so you have a much bigger term uh, in the quantum mechanical part. But then if you also engineer the structure to go from just one point to this ring, uh, then you have much bigger uh, joint density state. So uh, we show that in cubic tin selenide, uh, when you change the strain, actually here we prefer a strain-free state. Uh, then you have this next hat band structure. Then you have a much bigger uh, optical gain. And uh, you also have this feature uh, in the optical con conductivity, which was recently verified experimentally, but they didn't actually made an infrared detector out of this. So we predicted uh, uh, by doing both uh, crystal structure search as well as string engineering, uh, a few of these topological materials, uh, which gives uh, up to a factor of 100 bigger uh, infrared absorption than these uh, known uh, mercury cadmium telluride uh, material uh, for infrared uh, response. So, uh, wrapping up, I just like to say that, uh, you know, this ultimate, uh, you know, mechanical alloying. Uh, I think in the long run is going to be uh, uh, very competitive with uh, chemical uh, metallurgy. Uh, but why haven't we you know, heard uh, very much about it so far, right? It's still somewhat of a niche topic. Uh, it's because you need four things. <clears throat> and these four things uh, simply were not available uh, three decades ago. Uh, the first uh, pillar one is you need to have material which can sustain you know, 7% uh, tension this way and 9% uh, uh, shear that way. And, and before 1991, there was just not that much you know, materials which can do that. But now we have thin films, we have bulk nanocrystals, we have nanowires, graphene, you know, we have many, many things, useful things which can uh, sustain a very large dynamic range of shear and tension and they would just keep it there at room temperature for months to years. And they don't creep them away. They don't relax them away. A uh, second pillar is we need to be able to apply force and uh, stress uh, and then simultaneously measure uh, changes, let's say in the band gap, magnetic properties, superconductivity at that scale. Uh, with AFM, with MAM indentation, now with MEMS, MEMS uh, lab on a chip, now uh, we're able to do this, uh, both applying the string and measuring the changing properties. Uh, pillar three is, uh, you know, let's say I want to have a 5% uh, uh, sheared silicon uh, at 70 Celsius for three years. But actually after four months, I found uh, that elastic string is gone. I want to know what happened. Uh, it was, was it fracture? 
or that uh, surface diffusion or cobalt creep, or that dislocation nucleation from the surface, you know, that caused dislocation uh, creep. <laughs> so I'm curious, you know, what, what relaxed uh, that strain? Uh, and now we have very powerful tools like uh, in situ uh, TEM, uh, in situ uh, synchrotron. Uh, we have uh, uh, atomistic simulations which deals with uh, long time scale uh, challenge, uh, these hyperdynamics, uh, diffusive molecular dynamics, uh, you know, all these uh, accelerated time scale methods in order to study these uh, deformation mechanisms. However, I want to say that uh, the philosophy of pillar three is the goal is somewhat different from traditional uh, mechanical methodology. We want to understand these mechanisms not for forming, because traditionally, you know, we try to understand this for you know superplasticity or for you know stamping a, a metal sheet into into car panels. We use these for forming purposes. Here, we understand this mechanism in order to defeat them. So we don't want to have any of them. Um, so uh, the goal is to understand these mechanisms in order to defeat them, in order to know uh, the time, uh, stress, uh, temperature, size, envelope, uh, where we can drive uh, materials to these uh, string energy densities. So these are metastable states but we're going to lock them in there and not have any of these creep or fracture or, or, uh, or plasticity mechanisms and purely elastic. And finally, uh, after all, we're not uh, in the stone age anymore. So we don't have to do all Edisonian approach. We have very powerful DFT methods, uh, which can tell us you know, what is the uh, ideal strength surface you know, with the machine learning that I showed at the beginning. Uh, now we, we really have a handle on uh, the phonon structure, uh, the ideal strength surface, and what would happen to the properties. So you would ask questions like, you know, if you shear in this particular direction to 70% of the ideal shear strain, what can this give us? What profit can it give us? Uh, then, you know, changing superconductivity, for example. And we have all these very high powered methods which can actually uh, give us very good ideas what you know what you can get uh, for those hypothetical questions and string engineering first found application uh, in lasers uh, in 1990s and then uh, uh, in the mid 2000s uh, you know it was brought to uh, big time so now it's uh, tens of billions dollar industry but i think you know in the long run uh, this has the ability to change uh, civilization because uh, five percent strain silicon is not uh, two percent strain silicon, and five percent sheared silicon is not five percent tensile silicon. So I just want to say that, just finally, that there needs to be a paradigm change uh, in the semiconductor design because we are used to this kind of deposition-based uh, devices. Right. So this is what we have today. Now you know people are building many many layers, and now people are talking about three D uh, architectures. So I think in the future, we will have more uh, MEMS-like devices combined with electronics. So what you see here is an actuator from uh, a Stanford group uh, made by uh, Lysium Naubait. <coughs> and they were uh, straining uh, this uh, freely suspended bridge so that they changed the cavity shape and size and to have a, a, a architecture strained photonic response. So in my group, uh, I have a postdoc, uh, Dr. Bao Ming Wang, who is developing these uh, thermally strained, uh, freely suspended uh, structures. And then in the middle, now we're collaborating with uh, Professor Del Alamo to put down these kind of thin fat structures, which is more three-dimensional and freestanding and much more similar you know, to our uh, size-dependent mechanical test. Right? So this looks like uh, this kind of fundamental research, but the goal is to actually integrate a MEMS actuator with devices. And we've already made some progress. Uh, uh, I mean, because of COVID, there are some issues, but the goal is to do both experimentally, but also to design with uh, TCAT modeling. So these are final element simulations solving both uh, the strain field, but also the Poisson-Boltzmann equation 
to look at you know how the current distribution goes depending on the dopant profile which you can engineer and the strain uh, dependent band gap uh, and to get the uh, current voltage uh, distribution and to get the heat uh, very important you need to get the heat out uh, so basically to uh, simulate these uh, with console so multi-field simulations and also use our machine learning and deformation mechanism studies to give sort of safety margins for these devices. And then for on a particular geometry, we have to measure them, uh, but also uh, there has to be some kind of topological optimization, right? So we can, once we have done this kind of simulation, we can do machine learning and then, uh, you know, change the geometry and they may evolve into, you know, very complex geometries like these. Uh, and, and the goal is that, you know, eventually uh, we can uh, both in the computer design these uh, string engineer devices, but also be able to fabricate them and, and have these uh, suspended uh, free loading, freely suspended loaded geometry. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome questions. Thank you, Ji. Um, fantastic talk. Um, so uh, now we are going to uh, call this uh, panelist and uh, participants for questions. So I have three, I have several people raise their hands. Uh, Ted, uh, can you uh, go first? Yeah. So you, you, can, uh, can, I, you, can I ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen so we can see the panelists? Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you, Ju. Uh, fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. And it really gives uh, an overview of the sprint engineering, this uh, uh, important and emerging field. And my question is actually on the, uh, the definition of the sprint engineering. You actually give a very well-defined uh, 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 range in terms of, for example, you actually termed this deep sprint engineering. There were a certain range of strain. Uh, I remember it's zero to six to seven percent in one of the slides. So uh, that's in terms of the magnitude of the strain. Uh, I believe you also, in some of part of your uh, 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 um, talk, you mentioned the indeed not only the strain itself, the strain gradient can cause other change of. Um, properties sometimes could be dramatic or remarkable. So we know that actually, if you want to introduce a string gradient, you don't really have to go very large string, right? So uh, as long as the, uh, the, the, uh, the small string occurs at a small range, the string gradient can be large enough. Um, I remember you showed one of your uh, nature photonic paper back in 2012, right? So uh, you have this tapered shape of the Sample. If you do a uniaxial tension, uh, you can increase the uh, introduce the string gradient. So um, uh, we collaborated with uh, uh, some scientists in the uh, uh, NIST, uh, and there were also a lot of uh, study in the uh, graphene community that if you introduce this string gradient, you can generate the pseudo magnetic field of very large uh, uh, intensity. So in that case, for example. Uh, the maximum strain is on the order of 1%, just 1%. But we know that the graphene can sustain like uh, 10, even 20% without pressure in principle. Now in this 1% strain, as long as you can introduce in a small range, you can introduce the strain gradient large enough that can, for example, generate a pseudo magnetic field with the intensity up to 10, 20 Tesla, which is already beyond any lab magnet you can achieve. So. My question actually is, if you look into the string gradient as one of the potential direction of also the string gradient, uh, I mean the, the string engineering, do you have any gut feeling? Um, I think it's two level of questions. So is there any uh, sweet spot of the string gradient in terms of the similar like a deep uh, string engineering you introduce for string? Uh, that we should look into. Second is, uh, what kind of properties uh, will be more 
related or uh, strongly tied to this string gradient instead of string. Thanks, Tung. Yeah, so I, I, I was a fan of that paper uh, that you did with NIST on the, on the pseudo-magnetic field. That's very inspiring uh, to us. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the uh, string gradient is part of this inhomogeneous uh, elastic string engineering. And we know uh, it actually controls uh, the nonlinear optical response. So uh, you're absolutely right that uh, if, if you create a, you know, in this nano object, you can have very large string magnitude, but also because the size scale is so small, you can have, you know, tension 10% to maybe compression minus 10% just across uh, 50 nanometers. So you can generate really huge uh, string gradient. And we know from the flexoelectric theory that uh, there are responses like uh, polarization uh, that couples to string gradient. Uh, because for example, in silicon, uh, if you don't have, if you have uniform strain, then, then there are certain symmetries that you, you still maintain. But with a shear string gradient, you can strongly break uh, things like inversion symmetry. So there are things like, uh, uh, electric polarization uh, and the nonlinear optical response, uh, which, which strongly couple to the, to the elastic string gradient. And uh, when you talk about string gradient, uh, it goes from uh, you know, nine dimensional now to 12 dimensional because uh, you definitely need machine learning and you definitely need uh, this uh, deep space uh, data mining uh, because all kinds of crazy things indeed can happen uh, with, with string gradient. And I also want to say that uh, when you have a string gradient, the DFT calculation is not straightforward because DFT calculation, because it uses purely boundary condition, you cannot apply you know, a bending curvature kind of string gradient straightforwardly. So there needs to be some innovation uh, in, in the calculation as well. So that's indeed a, a, a huge uh, uh, front to, to explore. That's great. That's and and I also you. want to say that, uh, yeah, so according to my sort of terminology, string engineering has uh, inelastic string and elastic string. The difference is, you know, elastic string, you're still within one uh, convex energy basin. It may not be quadratic. You may have, you know, quartic, uh, you know, cubic and ter quarter terms, but it's still overall convex. Mm -hmm. But when you go through the energy landscape, you know, you go through this concave region and go to another phase, uh, go to another base, and that's the inelastic string. So, uh, so you can have, uh, you, there's definitely a lot of inelastic string here one can do, like in all the, uh, the, the, the shape change, uh, shape, sh shape, uh, 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 shape change memories and, and all, all these pseudo elastic behavior as well. So, so that, that's another very big field. But so far, you know, I've mostly focused on, on, on elastic string engineering. And, and even elastic string engineering, you can have uh, homogeneous, inhomogeneous, but you can also have dynamic uh, strains, like you mentioned. Uh, because when you have this, you know, freestanding geometry, this is, I think, you know, our advantage compared to the chemical alloying people. Because in, in, in chemical doping, you have a dope, doping profile that's either done by uh, ion implantation or by diffusion. And those were all done in the fabs. And once it's done, you can change it easily. But once we have these MEMS geometries, you know, we, we can dynamically change it. So I think we actually have a, have a leg up compared to the, to the chemical uh, alloying approach. Yeah. And so it's you can have this uh, uh, dynamic and uh, inhomogeneous string engineering where String gradient definitely is, is a very big deal for, for certain properties. Yeah, it's re reversible and also you can call it it's on demand. If you need it, you introduce a string there or a string gradient there. When you don't need it, you, you, uh, you unload and then it's going, going back to the original. This is great. Thank you very much. Very inspiring talk. Thanks, Tom. Great. Uh, Tian Tang from Canada. Thank you, Suning, and thank you, uh, G, uh, for this talk. Very rich and very exciting. Uh, so my question is on the uh, your phase diagram for the uh, band gap. Um, you plotted the band gap as a function of string energy density, which is a scalar. So I'm, I'm wondering um, 
how important is the actual strain state uh, if you go back to the tensor space of the strain. And, and when you do the machine learning uh, study, did you use the individual uh, strain components as your descriptor or, or the strain energy density? Yeah, uh, totally. So this is just for quick visualization for human to, to visualize. But we actually did uh, go to uh, tensor strains and uh, in this kind of a, you know, higher dimensional plots. So uh, uh, like we have this kind of phase diagram where you know, we have two string components. So in the actual finite element calculation, uh, I'm, I'm like we also have this kind of crazy uh, ways of plotting things because you can't visualize a six dimensional. So you can, once you have the machine learning model, you can very easily visualize then, but basically, in, in this kind of finite element calculation, we use the, the full blown uh, six dimensional constitutive relation and, and the phase diagram to classify. Okay, so in the machine learning, uh, what other descriptors that you used in the, uh, in the machine yeah, learning? Yeah, we, we use the strain and uh, we, we use a strain to learn the, the band structure and, and also the, uh, the strain energy density. So, so there, is a, there is a formalism in the papers that we put out that not only learns the energies, but also the second derivative of the energies, which are the effective mass. So it can be done uh, numerically to pretty efficient. You, instead of you know, tens of billions of calculations, really trillions of calculations, we can just do uh, a few thousand calculations sometimes and give you pretty good representation. Okay, thank you. And I also have a very, very fundamental question on the electronics. Uh, how do you categorize uh, direct metal, indirect metal, uh, direct band gap semiconductor and, and indirect band gap uh, semiconductor? Yeah, yeah. So the direct means that uh, the, uh, the conduction band, uh, sorry, the, the, the valence band maximum and the conduction band minimum, they have the same wave vector. So all you need uh, is just an energy and you create an electron hole pair. But sometimes the conduction band uh, minimum is at a different wave vector point. So in that case, uh, you, even if you have just photon energy matching that band gap, you cannot generate an electron hole pair. You also need a phonon to assist. So that greatly reduce, that, that, that requires a much thicker uh, photovoltaic film for, 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 for that to happen. So it's basically not only the, the, uh, the energy, but also the, the wave vector of, of the electron and whole wave functions. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, our next uh, 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 questioner is uh, Tahir. Hi, Tahir. Hi, hi, Julie. So nice, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful morning. Uh, two questions, one is specific, which is, in the niobium stress strain response, it returns to the original shape, but it has a little hysteretic loop. Uh, what is the mechanism by which it gets the hysteretic loop? Does it depend on the rate of rate of loading unloading or? Uh, yeah, no. so thanks, thanks, back here. So uh, it's uh, uh, because that's the macroscopic yeah. uh, mm -hmm. of the composite. And in the composite, the BCC niobium is uh, we think is truly elastic. That's that's just uh, no 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 inelasticity. But mm -hmm. the niton node, the, the nickel titanium matrix, is undergoing B two to B nineteen prime reversible mm -hmm. uh, stress uh, assisted uh, Martin city transformations. So there is some energy dissipation associated with that phase transformation, but uh. it's so elastic. So it always goes back to B two when when there is no stress. Okay, okay, so that, that makes sense. Okay, even though there's a small amount, but it has to consume that energy to change phase. phase from yeah, the, the matrix can't take uh, 6%, but yeah. you can do it in a pseudo elastic fashion and by matching the true elastic with the pseudo elastic. And it turns out that this B2 to B19 prime is very gentle yeah. at the atomic level. So yeah. that, that, it's not like a dislocation, it's like a very sharp knife that's cutting mm -hmm. the areas. So you preserve the integrity of the, of this phase boundary and uh, we yeah. think that's big. So, so it's like a two phases, so compatibility is maintained. Yes, yes. And yes. one phase brought, brings the whole thing back yes. to where it started from. Yeah, very nice. More general question is, it looks like the four pillars that you described, um, uh, the first one on the left top, needed uh, the large strain to be uh, sustained for the strain, energy, for the, the strain engineering. 
But all in electronics, we know that the doping is a critical part to create the to create the devices. So the moment we have to have doping, large strain is probably very very difficult, right? Because of that's a wonderful all the question. Defects, yes, right. That's a wonderful question. So we actually have uh, some work we're going to submit soon on the nature of the dopant uh, with strain, and it turns out that yeah, the, you're you're right in, in one sense, but. Uh, a lot of those dopants are substitutional. So mm -hmm. uh, if they're substitutional, it's better uh, than uh, you know, uh, interstitial type of dopants. And, and you can still, still sustain uh, more than 10% strain, even with point, uh, point defect, because if they're substitutional dopants, you, you kind of still preserve the bonding network inside. Uh -huh. OK, OK. So is it possible to have the dopants actually helping more to get higher strain? In other words, it does reduce. It does. It, 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 unless there are some really crazy anomalies, but general trend is, yeah, it does reduce, but not by too much. Ah, okay. I was thinking that is there a possibility that, you know, ten percent strain is pure material, small and defect free. But is there a possibility that adding the defect can even exceed that limit? To let's say even fifteen percent. I don't know. I'm just this is a crazy thought that I'm. Principle uh, possible, but. Uh, uh, I think you have to really uh, design the, the, the maybe maybe you also need to coordinate like uh, but if you do that then maybe you, you change it to a different but but uh, yeah I, I think I think it, it's, it's in principle uh, possible but so far we haven't seen an <laughs> example of that okay okay yeah yeah now I was thinking more of the interaction between the dopants themselves within the matrix of the original material whether that could induce or facilitate even higher strain than the material itself, but maybe not yet clear. Uh, I, yeah, that's a good point because sometimes the, uh, the, the impurity ping the dislocation. So yeah. if you know, in things like silicon, the, the, sometimes the macro strength is controlled by dislocation motion instead of mobility. So yeah, that's, that's actually very interesting. So, that may be possible in, in that sense. So I was I was thinking of this, so dislocation nucleation. I think it may yeah. make dislocation nucleation easy, but right. in terms of pinning dislocation, that may actually do something. No, I, I think that that's actually very much interesting. What worth to look into actually. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tahir. Hey, Jigong. Hey, you. Actually, brilliant talk. Just brilliant. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, now, I understand that you, this talk is on string engineering, mostly crystalline materials. Uh, but I have a question, more general question, you're so general. So uh, conversation, uh, more generally. I, I teach an undergraduate course on thermodynamics. The main character, just one material, water, for steam table. And uh, last time I taught it, I actually learned how steam table in modern time is constructed. I don't know if you know this. It's a modern practice now. Of course, uh, constructing steam table um, has uh, about uh, 200 years of history. Yeah, 200 years of history. Started from France, uh, doing essentially by measurement, very little theory. But in nuclear, we use it a lot. I, I guess it's probably a lot of measurements of uh, vapor, the pressure versus temperature. Yeah, I don't know actually how exactly how people measure. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, interesting. There is an organization. I'll come to the discussion. I want really want to get your take, but it, uh, let's let me uh, first describe how they do it now. So what they do now is uh, because for water, it's a single component, right? And uh, you don't talk about any chemical reaction, just water molecule. So this water molecule, uh, water is characterized by two independent variables in temperature and volume, let's say. So what they do is say, say, okay, I have a um, Hamholtz free energy as a function of uh, temperature and volume. Once I know this function, I know all possible thermodynamic uh, properties, equation states, right? This is a well-established then here's a, how, how do they get this function, function of two variables. Ham holds the free energy as a function of two variables, temperature and volume. They use a fitting function of 80 plus variables. That's what, they, that's what they do. Now, the steam table you use today is constructed by this 80 parameter fit. 
So then I, I try to look at it. 80 parameters is that's just so unphysical. Uh, so uh, anyway, but uh, the point they, they have is that they have lots of measurement historically. And also they also historically have many models in particular when um, temperature is high, volume is large, you need to uh, converge to ideal gas equation, right? Things like that. So, th so this uh, uh, huge function is analytical, has 80 some parameter, fitting parameter, but it does have a functional form. It's actually condensed, uh, I guess, 200 years of uh, knowledge of this thing. As a result, this function can even predict, not terribly accurately, but predict to, to some extreme condition. For example, water can also sub subject to uh, tension. Normally you would say water cannot subject tension, you have a cavity, but if you do experiment carefully, you do string energy engineering, people can apply tensile stress, hydrostatic tensile stress, all the way to 10, even 100 megapascal. So this 80 parameter fit can somehow also predict that kind of behavior. So the question to you, uh, and may maybe it's just a conversation. Now I'm more interested in soft material, right? Non-crystalline water, just one simplest possible example for us. So we want to really care about a polymer. So we don't know how to characterize the character for example, cavitation or fracture, lots of mysteries. So in, in your kind of calculation, how, how much can you do? Starting with the simple thing, water, how much can you do? Yeah, I think in the case of cavitation, uh, it has to do with the new creation of a bubble. So it has to do with the surface energy. And so from first principles, you know, one can estimate uh, the surface energy for given temperature condition and then uh, use homogeneous nucleation theory to look at the cavitation probabilities by the work of uh, like a Professor Turnbull. Uh, so you can have some over uh, tens tensification. So generally uh, it, that, that kind of work is <laughs> similar to the physical metallurgy work because you do care about boundary conditions. Because let's say if the container, you know, have some Building uh, cracks, it may actually change uh, these uh, these nucleation rate of of, of cavities. Uh, so it's very complex and uh, boundary condition dependent. So I, I'm just thinking that in the case of bulk water, it doesn't have the equivalence of that nano effect. You know, smaller is stronger, hot patch relation type of thing. Uh, yet, so at least I I haven't. I haven't seen, you know, uh, maybe there is. There is actually confined water, actually, Zhigang. Uh, now, now you, you, this is a very good topic because, yeah, now I think, think about it is people actually have studied uh, equation of state of water when they are in carbon nanotubes. So they form these one dimensional chains in a carbon nanotube. And indeed, uh, the, the melting point are different. It, it shifted a lot by like 100 Celsius. So the equation of state of confined water, which they probe by uh, neutron, by X-ray, is quite different from bulk water. So maybe by adding external confinement, uh, you could do engineering on these hydrogen bonded uh, soft systems. Uh, but also I've known that uh, Professor Gang Chen, uh, his group has looked at the polymers. And the polymers, when you stre stretch it, and they're highly aligned, actually give you much higher thermal conductivity uh, than when they are disorganized. So I think there are certain examples of, of string engineering uh, on soft material. Uh, and, and also there is a, a good examples in, in foldable uh, materials, like you, know, you, you can do the flexible electronic, then there is Kirigami, and you, you basically use the soft mode of bending to, to induce a three-dimensional reconstruction. Let's say previously it's a flat thing, but when you crush it, it goes into, you utilize the buckling mode to have three-dimensional structures, and that is also reversible, and you can call, you can call that the bending elastic string. So, and that does change how the antenna, let's say if you want to make an antenna interact with uh, electromagnetic wave. 
So th there are some examples of, of soft material uh, changing, changing properties, but I think the key is still how much can you take? Because you, you got to first drive uh, this material to a state which is physically different from your original water. So in the case of the confined water, it's, it's because there is, a, there is a graphene or carbon nanotube wall which confined their conformation. You, you break up the 3D hydrogen bond network to 1D hydrogen bond network. In the case of the polymer, you, you literally change their structure align them. And then in the case of foldable antenna, like a, a flexible silicon, you change their you know, macroscopic morphology. So something substantial has to change uh, on, on either the atomic structure or the meso structure or the macro structure, depending on which one affects your properties. So I think this string engineering is maybe more uh, general than just the lattice string. Mm -hmm. Because generally, you know, you have multi-scale structures uh, 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 and, and, and uh, depending on, you know, which scale of the structure affect, you know, our property of interest, you can actually have string engineering at different, at different uh, length scales also. So uh, yeah, it's just a bit bring you back to more basic things. Are uh, so just let's say just talk about the strength, tensile strength of water. So it's uh, established for some time in tall trees, trees as ordinary tree, tall. Uh, the water inside a tree is under hydrostatic tension, about one megapascal. Routine every day. So, uh, and also in doing lab experiment, even in my uh, dirty lab, it's possible to design very simple experiment to make water under hydrostatic tension go to megapascal, easy to design this experiment. So, but, so, uh, so we, we try to think about in terms of, um, you know, as you said, uh, you know, uh, surface energy, uh, this kind of thing. But then that requires you to know the size of the floor. And we have no idea. And also other people uh, more, do more careful experiment can go strength, tensile strength to 10, 100 megapascal. What, just water. So what I don't feel comfortable is, uh, or uh, what I want to get from you is, uh, now suppose you carefully with uh, your talent, right? Carefully calculate strength, ideal strength of water. Is that possible now? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, I think uh, people in single molecule spectroscopy, in biology, so when they look at uh, these ligand uh, substrate interactions, you can pull a single chemical bond to failure. And we know the strength of the hydrogen bond is like a 0.1 to 0.2 electron volt. Mm -hmm. So if I just have a single water molecule that's hydrogen bonded to another water molecule, that bond is not weak. Uh, so there is some kind of uh, ideal strength of the hydrogen bond. Now, the reason the bulk water is sheer weak is because they, they don't break one and form one. They sort of break and form at the same time. So there is a collective dynamics in the, in the, in the, in the stress relaxation. Uh, in, this, in these experiments, it's under hydrostatic tension. Yeah, the, 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 it can be under tension. No, 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 no. Hydrostatic tension. There's even no... hydrostatic tension. It's, it's okay because that, that's sort of testing the right. not not bond switching, but really uh, the, the the pooling strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but I do think you know in the in the tree example you gave, and in the single water molecule experiment, it does depend on the size scale. I, I I'm not uh, truly an expert in that, but in my understanding. It, it, Strength uh, is a very context-dependent word, so it's just like the word ductility. Uh, it's uh, it, 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 one has to talk about ductility of of of, of what size and, and what component. It's not actually a, it's not actually a uh, molecular structure property. Strength is not a molecular structure property. We can maybe define ideal strength to be a molecular structure property, but strength and the toughness, these are 
very dependent on, on, on the size and the history uh, that this was exposed to. Now in, in liquid water, because of relaxation, there may be not history, but I still think uh, there should be a, a, a size dependence. Yeah, I'll talk to you off front. We have a- Yeah, Chika, I think I agree. I'll just jump in, sorry about that. I agree with Dri, uh, Dri about that. I think uh, if I understand in the case of liquid water, in the bulk phase, if there's no volume constraint, it cannot support tension. That's gonna, in this phase diagram, you don't have negative pressure. Uh, when you drop pressure to a certain level, it will become a vapor. But if you have confined space with certain boundary conditions, depending on size, you can subject to tension. And that stress actually depends on the size. So I think with this some- uh, Size yeah. uh, bulk water? What's that? Millimeter size of drop, is that uh, a bulk water? Um, I don't know, remember exactly that the, the, the millimeter probably is close to, and, and you have to be careful that whether there are some other things in the one, whether it's pure water or other ingredients, the impurities that could change the behavior as well. Just speaking of the pure water, I think uh, in while, you know, we, we did some MD simulations and some analysis looking at this under tension, hydrostatic tension. Obviously, if you do a pressure control, it's very unstable. Once you put tension, it will become cavit cavitation and the vapor. But if you have the volume control, it, because it, the space is limited, it cannot become vapor uh, everywhere because it, it can nuclear a cavity uh, locally, but that how much is the nucleate, when the nucleate depends on the volume, your confinement essentially. So the strength, at least based on what I understand, as Jude mentioned, is not a intrinsic material property in that sense. It may depend on what's the volume or size uh, uh, in the water. So that's just the, uh, there are some evidence, I think experiments they do this confined liquid or bubble type, type of uh, uh, experiments. They, they found these strengths and varies widely from uh, a few uh, megapascal to hundreds of megapascal. That could be due to this size effect or other things. We don't fully understand. I think. Thank you. If, if I may, just a few seconds. A simple experiment that you can do is that if you take a solid plate, any material, and inundated in water, in the bucket of water. And then if you pull the solid plate very quickly from the floor, then you can increase the suction of the water enormously. Um, so you can have a very large negative pressure, a suction pressure, even though it is not confined. It's like a suction cup. So in liquid suction, if you just take the suction cup and press in the liquid, and then pull it hard, it can take you know, megapascals. And I think one, um, one of the earlier papers, I don't remember the papers. Uh, but I think, I think uh, that's, con that's related to the new creation uh, kinetics of the- Great, of the yeah, really fast. Uh, and, and also the, maybe the interface crack between the plunger and the water. But I think what Zhigang is saying is, can water sustain a static tensile stress? Right. So indefinitely- the Equilibrium state. Okay. Yeah. No, I've never known. We, I think if you want to predict it from the molecular or atomistic simulations, it will be very difficult compared to the experiment. You have to really consider the, the, the interface condition, right? How would you load it up? And what's the time scale? The water is not a crystalline, it's morphous. There is definitely a relaxation time scale that impose a challenge on the direct simulations. So, so maybe the best kind of plunger is a hydrophilic uh, plunger. So the water really likes to be on the boundaries. So in that case, I think we're looking at homogeneous nucleation of cavities in the bulk of the water. So that's why we can turn to uh, Professor Turnbull's theory on, you know, we can compute this nucleation rate. So there is a temperature, time, and, uh, you know, characteristic to that nucleation. And maybe under certain situations, nucleation is, is quite difficult. So you, you can over, uh, over, over tensile it. But thermodynamically, I think you can show that uh, as long as it's bulk water, indeed that the energy can, the Helmholtz free energy can go down just by having a cavity inside. If it's big enough, if it's really like kilometer cubed of, of water. And to, to follow 
uh, with Tahir comments, I think we actually did some simulations of uh, water as an interface between graphene and silicon oxide. So of course, in that case, you do have a developed high tension, um, even doesn't matter how big the bottom is, but at some point, the nuclear cavity at the interface uh, because of the interfacial properties uh, between water and graphene. Uh, as you mentioned, if you change the interfacial property, you may end up in some maybe ideal interfacial properties, you may not you may get a homogeneous nucleation in the, in the middle of the water, but uh, uh, we haven't done that. Yeah, I think there were papers published earlier, quite some time ago, establishing mm -hmm. that if there are no impurities in the in the bulk water, um, then the ideal cavitation pressure is 120 megapascal, negative megapascal. But then other experiments showed that the, that pressure goes significantly below because of the impurities from the surface, as you were mentioning, from the surface of the volume where the water is contained. But it is true that you know for the capillary pool in the long large trees, which is the only mechanism by which water is transported, and the water can be sustained with megapascal uh, negative pressure, and it's 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 there forever, right? Continuously supplying the water. Yeah, there is also theory so to predict the water in a tree is not yeah. a pure, right? So there's always some sugar in it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so true. It'd be very interesting to understand what actually happens in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also a theory to predict the strength at the level of 140 megapascal. 140. I mean, yeah. it's interesting to do an experiment with a very large capillary tube, you know, going back to mid Middle Ages experiments and increase the capillary tube length going to space and see how far the water goes and how long it stays. Great discussion. Great discussion. Um, Next is, uh, let's say, Ten Zhang. Ten? Hi, yeah. Uh, hi, Bradley. That's a uh, yeah, very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. And one is, uh, I noticed that uh, you use 2D material as uh, like an um, example for, for several studies. We know that uh, for many like a uh, method, like CBD, if you grow 2D material, you will have defects. So uh, my question is, uh, like um, uh, how do you consider the defects? And uh, for 2D material, we also know that if you have, you have defects, you will form a 3D shape, not a flat. And, um, and that are related to that, how the curvature and also maybe the strain induced by the defect will modify the other physical property and combined with your student engineer. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. So, uh... We know generally the 2D materials have dirt on them, hydrocarbons on, on the surface, and there are vacancies and also off stoichiometry, so it's not exactly one to two uh, sometimes. So they would generally uh, reduce the strength compared to the ideal strength. Uh, but nonetheless, experimentally, uh, people have shown something like a 10, 11% uh, tension uh, for, for, for some time if you control the environment. So for example, in a lot of these uh, chalcogenides, they're very uh, fragile when there is moisture in the air. So uh, we've actually developed some uh, corrosion uh, protection coatings on 2D materials. So uh, a lot of times the, the degradation mechanism is a stress corrosion cracking. Uh, and and you, you really want to uh, prevent the water from touching uh, the chalcogenides. So yeah, absolutely. So general real materials always have a uh, defect inside. Uh, but nonetheless, the experimental fact is by having uh, better environmental control and, and better material preparation process, you don't reach the ideal strength, but you can get to uh, 50, 60, 70% uh, of it. So, uh, and also on the, on the device level, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes the defects are useful. They are dopants, and sometimes uh, they're even, you know, device themselves. So uh, you you really, you know, the, the point is that if you can control the defect, uh, then they may be may, may be useful. They probably shouldn't be called defects. Call something else. It's the uncontrolled uh, defects which are which are problematic. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, my second question is related. Uh, um, this, as you mentioned, that uh, there are a lot of things going on in the permits, and that uh, basically is uh, in the larger time scale, like uh, seconds, hours. And I know that you have been working on the multi-scale in time for a long time. So my question, I want to hear your insight about um, how to match this, uh, like for the MD, the time scale, usually nanosecond, uh, microsecond. That my question is very general. That uh, like, do you think uh, whether we need this uh, multi-scale simulation in time? Or like, and also like, what's the um, uh, promising direction you think that if people want to do modeling simulation in the much scale uh, in time and what's the direction, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think the best news uh, is uh, Institute TM uh, because uh, to advance in multi-scale modeling, we, we need multi-scale experiments. Uh, in particular, uh, now, nowadays, you know, we can do simulation easily that matches the length scale of the in-situ TM. You know, the view field of a few hundred nanometers, we can easily have all the atoms in the in-situ TM mapped to a computer simulation. Now, the in-situ TM is also somewhat shorter compared to real materials in service. Real materials in service very often is years to decades. Uh, in the in-situ TM, you know, you can apply pretty extreme stress. Uh, for a short time, uh, and you know, you you're absorbing uh, observing things for you know uh, minutes uh, to maybe half an hour. So so you already get uh, quite a bit of benefit by doing the same system in the in situ TM, uh, you know, with experiments. So that's why we have a lot of uh, collaborations on in situ deformation. Uh, in situ electrochemical uh, charging, discharging, uh, in situ liquid uh, interactions with solid structures. So those brings a lot of useful calibration examples for these accelerated time scale simulations. Now on the accelerated time scale simulation side, uh, this is one of the two main uh, problems with atomistic simulations. One is lack of uh, a good atomic potential for especially for chemically complex systems. So I think recently uh, we've made a lot of progress in that by using neural networks. So I've been collaborating with uh, a Japanese researcher. We have now a potential that's pretty robust for the first 18 elements from hydrogen to argon. We get pretty sensible results uh, with, 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 with aperture combinations of the 18 elements. Uh, on the uncertain time scale problem is a different problem because there, we sort of have a lack of data. You know, you can simulate all kinds of transitions, you know, rate limiting steps, but how can you know they are the real rate limiting steps? So uh, I think in, in those uh, uh, development algorithms, uh, these in situ TM uh, calibrations are very important. And the in situ TM now is really getting down to atomic resolution. So we have actually recently been looking at some, uh, actually even Yang Yang have uh, some results at, you, you may be able to detect individual point defect, uh, individual vacancy or interstitials. Uh, and then with the electron beam, you can even manipulate individual atoms. So uh, a student of mine, Su Tong, he's now at uh, LBL, he have shown that with electron beam, you can move an individual dopant uh, atom on a, on a 2D material. So you can both see and you can also manipulate atoms with the TM. And I think that provides uh, the best uh, calibration for atomistic simulation people. And of course, on the algorithm development side, this is a grand challenge. Obviously, uh, Art Walter and you know, a lot of people have been working on this. And, and we've developed this uh, diffusive MD, which I think is still, uh, there's a lot of uh, things we need to explore uh, in, in those spaces. Uh, a key is sort of, um, you know, change of re representation because if, if you want to have atomic spatial resolution, uh, but you want to have, you know, something that evolves on, on the order of seconds, you pretty much have to give up resolving the atomic vibrations. So in order to gain some functionality, you have to, you know, get rid of some functionality. In other words, you have to cross grain over vibrations, 
but sometimes even diffusions. So, so you may not want to you know, resolve the details of an activated transition because that transition also happens at picoseconds. And why would you want to <laughs> resolve all those details? So, so before you know, we, we write down an algorithm and say you know, what we gain from this, you first have to write up a list of what you give up. So uh, you may want to give up a lot of the details uh, in, in developing this algorithm. Okay, thank you. All right, Jimmy. Uh, brilliant talk, very good talk. Uh, thank you so much to, uh, for, for the wonderful talk. When I raised my hand, uh, I wanted to ask about defects. Now the, the question of defects uh, has been asked not once, but at least twice. And I, I, you know, uh, Tahir mentioned that, uh, Teng Zhang mentioned that as well. And you've answered the questions even beyond what I wanted to ask. But nevertheless, uh, here's the issue that I, I see maybe worth uh, getting your brain or your, your take on this. So when Tong asked the question, he asked about string gradient. Essentially, your string engineering is to expand beyond the metallurgy or chemical metallurgy additional dimensions to manipulate the system so that the properties of the materials will be, uh, will be changed by this manipulation of strings. If you introduce string gradient, I'm not sure whether there are six more or maybe even a lot more uh, gradients that you have to introduce. That significantly expand the parameter space that you can play with. By introducing defects, it's almost infinitely expanding the the playground, essentially, the parameter space that you can play with. If you have your dream, what type of defects or what directions would you go uh, to expand your parameter space such that you can manipulate material properties? That's a great uh, question. Uh, yeah. yeah. For example, you mentioned interstitial, you mentioned uh, you know, uh, vacancies, there's dislocation, there are all these kinds of defects. Yeah. And combination oh. of them, just not one of them, combination of them. Yeah, so uh, uh, we cannot avoid the surfaces in many applications, so we have to live with them. Uh, but we can, uh, I think we want to steer clear of dislocations, uh, these 1D extended defects. We want to stay clear of uh, incoherent grain boundaries. The reason is they are somewhat difficult to control. So uh, I think uh, point defects uh, may be okay, especially substitution of dopants, they are useful. They, 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 they contribute carriers. Uh, and in fact, in things like diamond nitrogen vacancy center, you want them there because they, they, they serve a certain you know, uh, function. So, but it is really, uh, we have to, uh, get rid of all the glissol defects. So um, glissol dislocations, and also you can say crack is, if, if it moves, that's a very bad thing. So you can call that a glissol displacive motion of crack tips. You, you, those are the worst. We have to get rid of those. We, we, we may have some sessile defects like a surface uh, or sometimes a coherent uh, interface like a twin boundary may be okay because we know precisely what their structure and chemistry is. Uh, I think the, the, the goal is to, at least I think in the beginning is to reduce the en information entropy. Is, you know, in the experiment, when you look at, you know, you, all you have is some scanning TEM or some uh, high resolution TEM, you see just a blob of contrast, but you don't know what's really in there. Those kind of defects you know, we, we try to avoid. If we know what they are, we, we can label them, maybe, maybe they're okay. If, if they don't move. If they move, that's uh, very bad generally. So uh, glissol uh, extended defects are the worst. Crack tips, uh, 
glissol dislocations are the worst. And, and different types of defects have different characteristics. Uh, for example, dislocations are known to be associated with shear stress, right? So uh, if you can, uh, you mentioned one very good uh, point. If they don't move, they may be useful. If they're freely, if they can freely move, then they, they're useless to determine the uh, material properties. But there, there, there may be ways of, for example, fixing dislocation loops at certain locations. That makes it maybe locally, you introduce certain types of stress essentially. Uh, if you can do that, maybe you can uh, manipulate the local material properties uh, in a certain direction. But, uh, true. But true. That's definitely true. And that's the traditional physical metallurgy uh, thinking, which is you can have dislocation storage, you know, to improve the, the yield strength. And sometimes, let's say, you want to reduce uh, thermal conductivity by having dislocations in there, for example, uh, Professor Gang Chen and Professor Mili Dresselhaus have intentionally made the nanocrystalline uh, thermoelectric materials to scatter the phonons, uh, you know, reduce thermal conductivity while still keeping uh, electrical conductivity. So those were uh, indeed uh, uh, powerful approaches of controlling microstructure to give you desired thermal physical properties. But I think for string engineering of functional properties, because of the uncertainty in the information entropy of, 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 of dislocation loops, we do try to, I think, avoid them at, at the current stage. There might be come a day where we can create individual dislocation loop of precisely the right character of the precisely the right size, and they may be used for something. So that, that may well be possible, but maybe not in the, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Can I can I chime in here, if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah. So Jimmy, I, I, I think this is a wonderful discussion. Uh, Jimmy, your comment and your question actually, um, it's really insightful. Indeed, if you let, let's look into this, uh, uh, for example, uh, string gradient engineer, right? So that's actually existing everywhere in most of materials. Is just because in recent years, those technologies allow people to look into these uh, either strain gradient or control them or characterize them and uh, measure the, uh, uh, the resulting change of property, right? So for example, this, uh, this uh, you, you must know this, this, uh, the pseudo in, uh, magnetic uh, uh, field in graphene was uh, discovered by accident when people look into the bubbles trapped into the freestanding, not freestanding, uh, graphene on the surface substrate. They, they have these little bubbles because of the mismatch from the substrate. And then the, you have the capacity nowadays to really look into the uh, properties at those localized area. But if you think about the composite material, right, even a simple inclusion in a composite will introduce huge string gradient at the interface between the inclusion and the matrix. But the, 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 the effect of that string gradient has been unclear or at least not really of many people's interest in the past. I, the, one of the slides I really enjoyed in Ju's uh, talk is uh, you list the, in, in one slide, you show these four quadrants. In each quadrant, you have the uh, uh, different uh, capability, research capabilities, uh, and the new uh, bullet atoms added over there maybe every several years and allow people to really look into uh, down in the bottom or really increase or expand the capacity there that allow us to look into those phenomena or structures, properties that may already exist in there in nature all the time, but we. Until now, we start looking to it. So, um, we, yeah, that's my two cents on <laughs> this. We, we, until now, we couldn't realize those properties. Exactly, exactly. Like, uh, like the last quadrant uh, in your in, in your that slide is the machine learning, big data, whatever you call it, and that will bring in a new 
new dimension that even enable more potentials. Uh, I, I assume in the next 10 years, like we mentioned, 10, 20 years, then you will, 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 we probably will discover or review many more interesting things there. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tung. Yeah, so I think the, uh, like you said, the, the key word is engineering. So uh, we've got to be able to control, measure, characterize, and, and apply the right uh, tools uh, to, to those naturally existing uh, strain gradient and strain regions. And the other thing is uh, space-time volume. Uh, the, the key is to have this uh, uh, extended strain gradient and strain in, you know, even though it has grain size of nano, but we really want it to be at a wafer scale. So at least microns. And for uh, at least, you know, months, if not years or decades. And, and once we can have this high strain or strain gradient in a controllable fashion over extended space time volume, that, that can, that's really the, the, the door opener to, 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 to uh, utilization. So they, they are found in nature, but previously they were scattered, not controlled, and also too small and they move around. So now if we can have them in a, in a big space-time volume, lock it in and, and use it, that's, that's really the, the, the trick. And it's, uh, so that's why physicists can do it. I mean, physicists can, they know everything changed with strain, but, but you really need mechanics people, mechanics and materials people to you know, tell what is the temperature, time, uh, stress, size, envelope uh, to have these, uh, these creatures. Okay, great. Uh, last question from Tianju. <laughs> yeah, so first on uh, certainly it's, uh, it's great to see uh, the, the tremendous progress Zhu has made in the, this uh, important direction of uh, elastic string engineering. But I want to make some general comment. Um, so generally speaking, this uh, elastic string engineering is a really expensive thing to do, particularly for large scale applications. So on the other hand, we really want to have cheaper ways of uh, overcoming some major technological barriers. For example, you, you discuss this uh, string silicon as a uh, important example for, for real world application of elastic string engineering. Certainly it's, it's very appealing and uh, 20, 10 years ago, but based on my understanding in the past 10 years, people have developed, for example, this uh, film facts. So that's a really great technology breakthrough and it's in a cheaper way to go from 2D to 3D that enable people to overcome this uh, limit of Moore's law. They say and maybe in the coming 50 or 70 years, there's really no limit for FinFET in general. So certainly you are also talking about the combination of a FinFET with elastic string engineering that will probably give you another and, uh, dimension or a larger space to, to, uh, to push the limit. So yeah, still uh, just a general comment is uh, elastic string engineering is great, but it's, it's quite expensive. It requires a lot of uh, uh, effort and also uh, collaboration, I think. Yeah, yeah. Ting, Ting, I think you, you hit it right on the head. It is, in fact, uh, uh, it's way beyond, you know, any one person or any one group can do in terms of the workload. So uh, uh, this is something that we, we, we realize. And, and that actually has stopped, you know, uh, or sort of hampered us for very long because we don't even have the language uh, of the device people. And uh, uh, you're absolutely right that to compete with existing epitaxial strain based string engineering, you know, uh, they have, you know, billion dollar fab lines already made everything. All the process is, 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 is it's, it's, very, it's very difficult because cost uh, is, 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 is a big issue. So, uh, what I think needs to happen is we need to really move away from uh, the existing kind of architecture. So ThinkPad is, a, is a, I think is a breakthrough and we really need to integrate with uh, the MEMS fabs. It turns out that the, 
the CPU fabs, GPU fabs is different group of people from the MEMS fab people. <laughs> so I think uh, for string engineering to take off, we really need to have the MEMS fab people work with mechanicians and uh, work with materials people to develop new processes. And those processes are generally, you know, when you develop a process, very expensive, very time consuming. And I, I, I pretty much figured I, I, I need to collaborate with, with, with uh, other people. So I, I just cannot do it uh, by myself. So I would welcome, you know, uh, try to inspire people to, <laughs> to, to, to jump into this and, 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 and contribute. You're absolutely right. So it's, in the end, it is, it is uh, cost, cost uh, would, be, would be the issue here. But in principle, I would say, there, because we have demonstrated in the diamond, you can now pull these, not nano bridge, but actually micron sized micro bridge. And in each bridge, in principle, you can put thousands of devices in there. And you can, you know, so there is no like fundamental roadblock to doing this. Uh, it is time and money and, and people who are willing to, to, to throw, uh, you know, effort into it. So totally agree with you, Tim. Right. Great. Um, any other questions from the panel? We are already uh, like uh, at noon. Can I ask the last one? Sure, you're the okay. last one then. <laughs> okay. Well, this is a, a well, great talk. Uh, thank you, Ji. Um, this may not be just uh, for Ji himself, or maybe this is also for the panelists uh, here. Um, so uh, Ting and many other people mentioned uh, the, the application, the device people, the electronics people. So uh, what I know from my classmate, well, that's another student of Zhigang's. Uh, so Dr. Ming Huang, our friends, our classmates, uh, worked at the Texas Instrument about uh, 10, 20 years ago. At that time, about 15 years ago, at that time, uh, the device people are talking about adding dislocations or vacancies so that the performance of the transistors uh, won't be jeopardized. Because uh, if everything goes too small, you don't have much total number of charge carriers for the performance. But that's 15 years ago. I believe things would be different. So uh, does anyone know that, uh, I mean, of course that's totally, that's not elastic string engineering, that's defect engineering. Do we have anything new nowadays that's, uh, I mean, incorporating the elastic string engineering or totally abandoning the ideas of using dislocations and vacancies for the transistors? Yeah, I think uh, dislocations will be what I call inelastic uh, string engineering. And, uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, I agree with you. I'm just saying that uh, what, what the electronics people did 15 years ago, that's just uh, string engineering or defect engineering. So we are now 15 years later. I mean, things got uh, developed so rapidly. So any more examples or what is the current status? Uh, yeah, there, there's a big progress in point defect engineering. So there are these uh, single photon emitters and there are all kinds of uh, 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 electronic spin devices based on point defects that you can use. So a uh, lot, lot of progress in point defects. Uh, in 1D dislocations, uh, I think also 15 years ago, people have uh, discussed whether this can improve ionic conductivity. So maybe the, the, the oxygen or proton move faster along dislocation cores, but yeah. I haven't heard very much progress uh, on that uh, after that initial work. Yeah. So dislocation is still, I think, very tough to- But to... nowadays the people are talking about uh, five nanometer transistor. So how, how did they actually make it work? Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, in those uh, thin fat devices where there's a lot of surface, it's very important to passivate the surface. Because if you don't passivate it well, all the electrons flow through the surface. So you're actually using the surface as a device. And so, yeah, so I think, however, you know, uh, there might be device where you do completely use the surface. And in some sense, you know, 2D materials are all surfaces. So uh, I think, I think. Thank you, uh, thank you. good to know, yeah. Great, uh, thank you, thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, always uh, very inspiring. <laughs> So I also learned a lot from you. Um, so uh, I guess that uh, this is all for today. Um, uh, thank you uh, for all the participants. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, wrap it up. Uh, first of all, thanking all of you for participating in this uh, EML webinar. Ju, you made a very good point. You want to inspire people 
we are inspired. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure there will be other people that you want to inspire, for example, the uh, MEMS people and the uh, physics community. Uh, they're, they're fascinating, fascinating topic. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, the next two EML webinars uh, would be a mini series on stretchable and uh, stretchable electronics wearable devices. And the first one would be given by uh, Daehyung Kim from Seoul National University. John Rogers would host that particular webinar. That will be on Wednesday, July the 14th. Uh, because South Korea is, because of the time constraint, we wanted to start it half an hour earlier. So that's 10.30 p.m. their time, 9.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. And that particular webinar would be followed uh, three weeks later by uh, Takao Somiya of University of Tokyo, also on stretchable and wearable devices. Okay, I hope to see you all uh, in, in the next few weeks or so. With that, let me thank you again for the wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone. This has been inspiring discussions. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.